second requirement substantial money laundering, AML. Uh, so also not only to make sure that you are who you say you are, but also that you're not likely to launder money and commit financial crimes. Or even not to the past, no, no, no. or because of your political affiliations or whatever. Yeah. Your business, Venezuelan, drug war, sign. Right, or because you're not laundering whatever. Right. So there's actually a lot of, there's a lot of acronyms that we're doing out here. There's a lot of them. And so, given this, we're talking about we're not going to have capital rights. But it's very difficult to do this. And it's actually so difficult that as many as 50% of people who apply for them to make accounts online get rejected, not because they're bad customers or because they have bad credit or anything like that, but only because the bank is just basically like that shrug emoji saying, like, we don't know who you are, we can't figure it out. So you need to go into a branch report if there's no branch, you're just yourself. And sort of they're checking too few data sources. There's like a couple out there that people have been using for a long time, but they only include a certain number of people, or you can only get a certain degree of confidence from the data sets as they've existed for a long time. Right. Um, and so if you've moved recently, yep. or if you've changed your name, or just you're, you're young and you haven't established your, your, your credit card, you haven't yet, yeah, you haven't opened 10 credit cards with the same address for a long time, or whatever, you're getting harder to find. And so what we do is we build an API, which is uh, basically a way for computers to talk to each other. It's the data layer underneath the, the public state layer. So we submit APIs or what happens with that data to figure out. You had a really good way of explaining APIs. Well, thank you. I explain them like Legos. Yeah. They're like Lego pieces that stack on top of my iTunes account and Spotify that communicate to my fans in town app, which notifies me. Yeah. Uh, Besides, I was talking about getting back together. So. Yeah, so it's like, you know, whatever you use a Facebook app, they're using Facebook's API so that, you know, they can pull that data. So we send it for Twitter and then Tinder reports to your friends and tell you which of your friends you are friends with people you're matching with. That's an API. Got it. Data networks that are used for identification online also have APIs. And so what we've built is an API, which is a way for computers to talk to each other to identify people online. And it's, it's our system is designed to let people identify more people. So it's like Tinder for banks. It's like Tinder for banks. <laughs> Let's that. Got it. Um, okay, so as we talk about identity in general, why are we so concerned with preserving digital identity when it is such a easily corruptible and affordable thing? Well, identity is the fundamental layer behind all financial services. And what that means is like, if somebody wants to give you a loan and they can't know who you are, then they cannot give you that loan. And that seems simple, but it actually has really profound ramifications, which is that the people who are difficult to identify online, that means 50% of the population, it's not, you know, Wall Street members. It's underserved populations, it's immigrants. Immigrants are very hard to identify online because their back in their home country. No matter how rich or poor they are, very difficult. It's students, right? It's young people. It's poor people in general with no credit histories, bad credit histories. And so that is called thin and no file customers. And there's a lot of companies out there trying to give people access to reasonable loans so that, you know, when your car breaks down, you can still get to, you can get the loan to get, to get to work without having, you know, to pay an arm and a leg. Uh, there's people trying to give people bank accounts so that they can have to be storing their money on their mattress. There's all this stuff. And it's really important, but if you can't identify your customers, then you can't give them the services that they need. It's a problem that's very poorly understood and it's having really, really important consequences that are, that are like, would be really great to solve. There's yeah. also a user experience layer to this, which is like there's you know hundreds, thousands of new services coming out every single day to address niche parts of financial services, new ways to use technology to spend money, save money, invest money. And so when you are looking at getting people onto your new, you know, low fee brokerage app, you have to figure out what's the lowest friction way to get someone to do that. It's not a lot easier to listen when there's no cars. Their password or faxing in their W2 or how you can kill people. It's gonna be like what are the five fields I can ask someone to do when I'm on the subway in the morning, mm -hmm. uh, fill it out and actually be able to identify them. So there's a second like just being able to find people, but then getting them to enter the lowest amount of information possible, but still be positive they really are who they are. Right, because people get to a portal and they'll see this is taking 15 minutes, it'll drop out. Yeah. I think if I do want to explore further south, well, I don't know that the train is much quicker. I hate having people pick me up, put my bike in a car, but it uh, might be the best solution. Yeah, I'm going to have to do that for the eight miles in South Minnesota. But lower fees, like you can actually invest in the private habit of wealth manager, right? That's what's going to be really critical helping people have uh, the ability to sort of move quickly in society. But if you don't have a good, convenient way of establishing identity, it all falls apart. That's basically where we are today. So identity is really very important in helping people. I could take this back rack off. I'm not using it. I mean, I could potentially get the car and the leaf and the bike and the leaf. That would be a good thing to do sometime when. Wendy is so, out of town. Don't I don't know when that might be, but. That work really well, as you might know, going to school university. So it's not about like let's approve the credit card or the driver's license by having some electronic identification built into it. So you can do that. But it's really more about what are the other pieces of your identity. That's one data point. You have this holistic identity update that involves your driver's license, your where you went to school, your credit history, what you know, where you live. Even though we don't hold it against you. Um, yeah. And you know, ten other things that are probably either part of like physically part of who you are, what you look like, your fingerprints, your retina, things that you have done in your past, like where you went to school, things you carry, carry with you, like your phone or your ID. So it's about bringing all these together and having one holistic identity that takes all these just data points, not taking one single data point and strengthening it. Because I don't think so far that's really worked for people. Like, yeah. You know, it's not, it hasn't proven to be more effective. We're, we're not going to get people, everyone in the United States in the next five years to put their fingerprints in a huge data. Right. And it's been done in Pakistan, and it works. It's actually really effective. It's not going to happen in the next five years. I don't think it's going to happen in the United States. And so, in the absence of. Why? Why would that ever work? Would you want to do that? Do you want the government that has. I feel like they already do. Like, yeah. I, they, they, they know what I mean. Like, I got fingerprints at the DMV two months ago. Yeah, I had um, biometrics so. done to get a visa. But... I think biometrics are super interesting. I think, I think, yeah, I think it's people around the barrier of getting people to do I mean, it's not it's not the reluctance of it, although that would certainly be a factor for mm -hmm. some extension people no matter what. But I would say it's like the what are you going to do with every merchant at every 7 Eleven around the country is now going to have a fingerprint portal. The you know, guy down the street selling my sandwich at lunch is going to have it. It just doesn't make, I think that it's been hard enough to transition everyone to more seamless payments than when you get to like biometrics at like, a sale or. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, then, and then doing that online is even harder. Our companies trying to do it. Like, I hope. Sort of
to ignore. So you think it's not a, it's not this cognitive, like, oh, I don't want to hand over my info to the government issue. It's more of a scale issue of just getting people through the door. I think it's both. I mean, I, I can imagine, because the government would be that one that would have to do it. I just, I would do it. I would love it, because I would understand the consequences, but I cannot imagine that. It would be a political explosive topic for whatever reason. And, yeah. and you know, just, I don't, you know, inherently distrust the government, but my, my trust in them to get that done from a technological perspective and then scale it, like, at zero. So mm-hmm. in the absence of that, we're going to have to do what we do today, which is triangulation. Like, <laughs> this person knew their previous addresses, knew their mother's maiden name, all the information they provided us matched up with their credit history, and then, you know, they were able to identify that they were able to like, send a text message through the phone associated with their identity or something like that. Yeah. That's how our API works, yeah. and it's the only known objective technique for actually onboarding and identifying uh, large swaths of people. And I, I think for the, for the time being, for the foreseeable future, that is what it is in the United States and in the Western world. There's a lot of efforts, though, to do things that can make this a lot better, such as federating identities, that's, that's the idea of sort of sharing identity data across lots of different companies and institutions. Mm-hmm. Uh, that can be super helpful. That's gets problem with issues. There's ideas of using uh, the identities that are already on bank accounts to make this easier, which is being done in a little bit. There's ideas. None of them will happen quickly, and none of them will probably be universal, so we're going to be stuck in this identity hell for a long time. How do people regroup their identity? I feel like, you know, I've been using Instant Messenger. He's like, that's fifth grade, and there is so much information that I have haphazardly thrown into the universe about myself, my address, how they entered my credit card, and so you know, unverified uh, things on the internet, purchase things. I, how do you go about gathering that back? Because I am sure there is some gang of post Soviet digital hackers somewhere in Europe who have my social security number and you know everything about my knee surgery. How do you address that, like, as a layperson wanting to be secure with the way she's spending her money? Yeah, I don't have a answer to that. I think it's like your identity's been out there in these various So do you just embrace the fact that you've given it away? Oh, yeah. You embrace, you embrace the fact that it's going to build out more safeguards? Yeah, I mean, building out more safeguards, because it's not really your fault, right? It's not that you shouldn't be doing things online. That's going to be the reality of life, because you're going to be doing tons of things online, and even more things online in five years. It's that you need to be able to trust the websites that you're giving over information to, mm-hmm. and they have to trust that you do Amazon web right? services. You know, they get that website, they get that one. Or else you're going to trust. Yeah. Here's the good news. Your credit card's been stolen, and your identity's been stolen. That's a fact. I mean, like, I'm not even trying to be alarmist. Like, this, no, I, mean, no. I can prove it. There's, there's only two or three sources that probably need to use. Prove that your identity's been stolen. It has been stolen. Your credit card's definitely been stolen. And nothing that bad has happened. Great. So that's a good news, right? It's like, it's not that bad. Mm-hmm. Um, we are, we are, I guess you're right. Right. We're one of many companies yeah. now that are working to mitigate the downsides of that and make it, you know, make the world uh, yeah. safer. Yeah. Like, I do think it's interesting that people talk a lot about, like, you know, the target security breach and stuff like that. People talk a lot about how upsetting it is when people have their credit card stolen or hacked. I don't think people, like, I think everyone's kind of had that happen to them, right? Like, always you cancel a credit card and yeah. or this you know. And people don't really care. People continue using credit cards. Yeah. Like, that has not changed. Yeah, so, like, I'm never using you again. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's because there's this underlying assumption that your identity still hasn't been stolen. That's probably not true, also, but, like, it's a really different feeling to have someone has your social, someone has all the things they need to open a new service as opposed to someone using the existing service that you built. And that's what credit cards are. People don't care. And the other piece of good news about your identity being stolen is it can't actually, it's very difficult, even though it's been stolen, it's very difficult for it to be stolen. Which, which is to say that there's so many things about you that you have to know so much. To be able, like, the variations that somebody can use to verify an identity in our service alone are so wide that there, there's just an unbelievable amount of things we have to have stolen mm-hmm. to actually definitively, you know, forever. You don't have to do it quickly. Right. Whatever you're going to do, I have to steal your stuff and right away go, do my, read through my diary, yep. read through my diary. Yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot, there's a lot yeah. of things and it's getting more, and there's companies coming out and we integrate them every day to add more layers of things that only you would know or maybe you have access to your Facebook or Twitter, your public records or credit, your phone number, your bank. It goes on and on and on, and only you will really know all of that stuff unless the only way to have somebody truly steal your identity is for you to be like your mom. Right. Yeah. Well, I think so many so moms, moms are like enemies. Yeah, actually, no, family members are the people that banks are truly worried about. Just kidding, mom, you would never. No, it's okay. <laughs> when, you talk to, when you talk to a bank about what they're when you talk to a bank about what their goals are, a lot of it they'll come up is like, let's make sure this isn't his uncle or his, you know, right. his niece. Right, because they would do that. You know, I mean, I think that's why we misplaced the concept of like our social security number being taken, which I was always like growing up, I never would say that loud to anyone. I was like told to not ever share it. And then you realize over time, like that one piece of, I can leave, I can write a piece of paper if some people have it, first of all. Yeah. If you could open, you know, so you have to basically trust that the company that you're giving it to is using 10 other pieces of information to actually validate that I am who I am. But a lot of times they're not just using my social security number to enter my name correctly. And that's why I think it's really scary. But if you move towards something where you require 10 pieces of different types of information that only you would know, or maybe your mom, the chances of that going you know, sideways are, are minimal. I think that the triangulation of, uh, not to get too like, but the triangulation of like biometrics, devices, and knowledge yeah. are really important. So like, Perfect. if you can prove that you know some information that we're 90% sure that only you should know, and then you can, you can prove you have a device that we're 95% sure only you own, so you have it. And then we can prove some, like from thumbprint to eyes to pictures, any sort of actual thing about your physical being mm-hmm. is highly, highly, it's extraordinarily difficult to then really have your identity stolen. Yeah, and that's great news. You basically have to be kidnapped, which, you know, yeah. has its own set of problems. Right, exactly. If you're kidnapped, I think you're screwed. No, you're not. You're not. No, you're not. 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 You
years and tell decisions that may as well up by community. We ended up saying, if you use Alloy, you're going to have this like higher conversion rate, more customers will join, but ultimately you're also going to be safer. You're going to really know that you're onboarding the right people. You're not going to miss out on great customers that you were missing out on, but you're also going to be lowering your risk and, and fraud. And mitigating internal discord. And mitigating internal discord. We're, we're, we're really relationship counselors for, for, for uh, compliance and product teams. We have like harmony. Couple counseling. Yeah, I mean, identity is this puzzle. And we see these puzzles every day. You know, you're on the payroll company, you would be like, well, we need to verify. And then how comes this like complex series of steps that they need, like, they need to know that the, the business owner is this person who owns this bank account who's sitting behind the computer, who also has this device, who also definitely has enough money. And then like, it, it just it becomes this complex puzzle. And it's, it's kind of our job to say, well, here's what gets most people through. And also is going to make uh, the compliance department of your company and ultimately the government happy. Yeah. And um, that's really I mean, what's interesting about it is you have the compliance team and you have the growth team and both are also just representatives of other entities that are yeah. coming to people are really worried about the government, right? So regulators would come after them. And even sitting between that would be a bank, right? So you need some right. bank partner involved with all these fintech companies that they could sort of cut off that relationship if the compliance team or, or just the product was going wrong. And then on the other side, on the, on the growth team side, they're representative of the investors. So typically, you have a bunch of backed, 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 backed companies where investors are saying, like, row, 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 which is really interesting for So, you know, ultimately, it's sort of this chain of responsibility. Everyone's trying to work together. But we, we physically see, we can see the reactions to us when sitting with the product managers and helping to roll your eyes at the compliance teams, telling them to do and vice versa. Because it's just, they, they really have these jobs that are not meant to work together. So, we need to make sure don't work together. Let me ask them how that makes you feel. How makes you feel? I see. I see. Okay, so to wrap this up, I'm interested to know, kind of personally, what got you guys into it? You're pretty young. A lot of people who become fintech entrepreneurs have spent a lot of time in the industry looking at these you know, problems in the face, beholding all their ugliness, and they are fed up, and they're like, okay, I have a smart solution for this, I'm going to go do it. But you guys haven't spent time in that decades, mentality. Yeah. decades in a bank, those decades in a you know, insurance company suffering, and, yeah. and you just saw this problem, it seems like, just saw it immediately and went for it. How did that happen? What sparked it? And you're making a really sophisticated product for people yeah. who haven't had to suffer through the mentality. I think it's working on the other side. I'm going to have the girls. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 Part of it is that uh, we, we did face this internally, but it's not like we spent decades and had this like, major compliance headache on our hands personally. We, we in a shorter time. Yeah. Um, but what we did see was all the customers that we were doing, dealing with when we were uh, at a payments company, which is what we did for this, every single one of them, you know, I'd say 98% of them, had a problem that we now solve. And so we just kept seeing it over and over. So it wasn't even over like over 10 years. We saw this, it was just that we saw it a hundred times. Yeah. Um, and it was people turning away really good customers, knowing they were really good customers, but they couldn't identify them sufficiently enough, like for the government basically to onboard them. Mm-hmm. Or uh, they were really, really sophisticated internal tools, which we actually now mimic in the API that we built. Um, but they were spending hundreds of thousands of dollars hiring consultants, all of that just to get to a place where they could onboard the customers they knew who were really, really excited about it. I think and then from the, like why why we designed them to solve that problem. So we aren't these kind of two things. Just having worked in payments and we're actually from having worked in management. If that's just a tool to be seen, or this is your with more how you come and how you came, very convinced that financial inclusion, so so people being able to access more financial services that they need, loans, payments, remittances, things like that, really was like was a social issue that became very near and dear to my heart. So it kind of transitioned to like oh this is like a boring thing, thing, yeah, into like oh this is an important thing, and then this side part is I also like love entrepreneurship. And part of what we do is make being a financial technology entrepreneur a significantly easier thing because we're taking this massive, I mean, this thing that holds up launches like years. That's exciting. So, like, enabling entrepreneurship, I, I think enabling access to financial services for underserved populations and just populations in general, whoever it is. Overserved populations. Exactly. Uh, I think that's really important. And so, so like, I care about this issue. And, and so then, then it becomes like, well, are we good to solve it? And our technical team and me and, um, and Laura, we all like solving really complex puzzles. It's just an interesting thing. I mean, the, the problems that we get to solve, I find it fascinating. And so, when you find that intersection, something that you care about, something that you should be really good at, something that you think day to day you will be interested in, it's like, that's a great. I think mean, we were, we're here at the right time, which is like, we started. Doing payments at a time where more and more fintechs are responding to companies that are not in that market in the US and seeing just the explosion of things in the last three years, like Stripe for payments, things serving under banks, people in TO networks or with Finanzas or LendUp. There's just super exciting stuff happening right now. It's all really called back by this exact problem, actually basic infrastructure. And there's no reason they need to know how to build that themselves. They just need to go build a great consumer experience. And so we take that off the for them, but we just move here at the right time to say, like, this is exploding, let's be a part of it, let's do it. Sure. A good personal, like a personal story that I think about is uh, this guy Joe who worked with us in our last company. Mm-hmm. Um, we all left, he ended up leaving, and he became an Uber driver. And he, he's just a guy that's just clearly mired in debt and like always has a trouble getting by, but you know, he has a college degree and uh, he's kind of part of the like, other side of the American dream, like getting a degree and causing you to debt. And it makes it very difficult to kind of like you have to have a job given your situation. So he started driving for Uber, which actually what I was offering a lot of ways to get them. And then one day, his paycheck for Uber was going to delay and he needed to get gas in his car. And uh, so he needed to get a quick loan. And there's just nobody who could get that quickly other than a payday lender. If you're going to get a payday loan, you really want to get it from like LendUp, basically. If you want to get it from an online payday lender because there are good ones that like really mean well, um, LendUp being probably the best one. And there are none of those. Like, you go to the actual stores and they're horrible. They're all like, trying to yeah, yeah, if you're like five hundred, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he really wants to get this loan from LendUp. And it's and basically, if you think about the cycle, if he can't get the loan, he can't drive for Uber, which means he's going to go miss payments and he's going to overdraft the bank account and therefore he'll never be able to pay for it. It's a cycle where he'll never be able to get back in the car and do his job. Yeah. So he's going to stop. And he can't get the loan from LendUp because he's not regulated in Virginia. Right? That's just like pulling you back and doing this fundamental thing. Um, I think like my dad, I like, had my dad run cash over to him like that. And I think that was something that you should have did. Well, that's what I really admire about you is that you have the ability and the ability to have kind of recognize you're running in one direction and actually infrastructurally fundamentally there was something that was building not just you to have my back